Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to SHFM's Conversations That Matter series. I'm Rob Gephardt, SHFM's treasurer. On behalf of SHFM and the SHFM Diversity Council, we welcome you to the third installment of the series, Generational Perspectives, Empowering Change Now to Secure an Inclusive Future. As everyone is still joining the session, I want to uh, quickly mention a few housekeeping notes. Uh, please ask questions along the way and during the Q&A portion of the session in the Q&A window, which you will find at the bottom of your toolbar. If you wish to remain anonymous when asking your question, please select the anonymous button before you submit the question. And finally, the session is being recorded, so it can be played on demand and will be available tomorrow on SHFM website as well as our YouTube channel. Today's SHFM educational program was developed by the Diversity Council, and I want to give a special thank you to the Council and the planning team for this series and for the session. The series is designed to provide critical context on timely issues, including diversity and inclusion topics that encourage frank, solution-focused dialogue. With more generations in the workforce, a multitude of perspectives, experiences, and expectations are present in the workplace across the country. Today, we will hear from a dynamic panel of workplace hospitality professionals as they share their insights on the critical role diversity plays in recognizing the value of differences and eliminating systemic barriers to success. Uh, I hope that for those who have joined prior sessions, you have found the content as helpful and as insightful as I have. And uh, I'm very proud to be part of an organization that is taking a strong position on the topic of diversity and bringing uh, members valuable content such as the session today. We are pleased to be joined uh, by the panel who will share their generational viewpoints on creating a culture of inclusion and overcoming personal and organizational biases to succeed on their own terms. I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Eric Stallworth. Eric is the head of diversity, inclusion, and equality, people and culture with ISS Guggenheimer. Eric helped shape and lead the ISS corporate diversity and inclusion strategy. Prior to joining ISS, he was instrumental in leading the global DNI strategy efforts for Kimberly Clark, American Airlines, Rockwell Collins, and Motorola, where respectively he helped to implement and integrate the diversity and inclusion strategy into the corporate business model. Eric, thank you for being with us today, and I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Rob. Good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. I think that uh, the panel that we have assembled and the, tub uh, the subject and topic, I, I think just really brings a great marriage of, of uh, experience together. And we look forward to, to begin sharing that in the very, very, uh, very soon. Um, this ongoing series, uh, Conversations That Matter, uh, again, empowering uh, generational perspectives, how are we going to empower the change now in order to cure a more diverse and inclusive workforce in the future? You know, as Rob mentioned, uh, generational diversity is more broad than ever. We have over five different generations in the workplace. And on the surface, that may just seem absolutely chaotic to have that many different perspectives uh, and different generations coming together. It, it, it can sow division and can appear to be very chaotic. However, multi-generational workplaces can be extremely productive, highly dynamic, but only when you have an interracial, intergenerational environment of inclusion, where those perspectives are not only heard, but ultimately valued and valued in the way in which people feel engaged. So we're really excited to, to kind of get into this today. So today I'm joined by a very powerfully talented panel that will be sharing with us how they've embraced generational change to create productive and inclusive work environments. Really quickly, I'll just go ahead uh, on a, just a surface introduction of our esteemed panel. First, we have Z Shemi. Uh, she's a culinarian, founder, and uh, owner of Z the Cook. I, I really like Z the Cook. I mean, that sounds almost like, you know, these one person, one name people, you know, Jay-Z, Cher, Bono. Uh, Drake, uh, you know, a few others. So I feel already that we're, we're in good company. I, I think I would probably legally want to change my name to Z the Cook. If that was my, <laughs> so uh, we're looking forward to that. Tony Duckett, uh, Senior Vice President and uh, Director of Sales for Vivro Advanced Water Systems. 
And then we have also Edward Lowe, Vice President of Sales for Volante Systems, and Brisbane Villancourt, uh, Vice President of Operations uh, at Airmark and LifeWorks. I'm really excited to have you guys with us today. Welcome to all of you. Great. So um, in addition to that sort of cursory introduction, I'd like for each of you to maybe introduce yourself. Take a minute or so just to kind of round out that introduction and tell us about a time where you felt that your difference made a difference, where you felt valued and you felt that you were included in belong and, and had a sense of strong belonging. Let's start with Z. Z, um, tell us a little bit more about you and, and what's a, a time that you recall where you really felt that you belonged. Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, so my name is Z Shami, Z the Cook. <laughs> As you mentioned, Eric, thank you so much for that great intro. Uh, I'm the owner of Z the Cook Culinary Studio. Uh, we like to bring people of all cultures, all races, all backgrounds together in the kitchen um, to enjoy cooking together for some team building opportunities where they can really um, be embraced in a positive environment, build new friendships. Um, so, so being on this panel just is so special for me. It's, um, I feel like I'm home as I always feel with SHFM um, and being that we teach culinary classes and you know uh, bring people together now with a time like this with COVID-19 um, you know it's a little hard that we're all apart but this brings us together and we feel so aligned. Um, I feel uh, like I felt inclusive um, during the SHFM event in Palm Springs last year. It was my first time joining um, the society and I was really nervous. I, I knew I looked different than everyone else. I wasn't sure how I would feel welcomed. And I kind of kept to myself in a little, in a, in a, for a while, cause I wasn't too sure, you know, what was gonna happen. And, you know, Danny Peterson, she came up to me and it was the most like, most loving and um, warm embrace at the time because I was, I guess, waiting for someone to make me feel comfortable. And I, I was trying to be comfortable on my own, but she really helped to confirm my comfort to bring me in and she welcomed me. And when everyone else seen Danny um, kind of come up to me, I think that it brought everyone more closer to me. So I felt really included and I felt like this is my moment where I can share who I am more and, you know, express myself more. So thank you to the SHFM family for making me feel included, um, especially today. So thank you for this. Great. Thank you for that uh, explanation and uh, uh, introduction, Z. You appreciate that. You're absolutely right. There is something that when you feel different or you feel odd or the odd person out, that we naturally sort of equate that to something less than or at least uncomfortable. Even if you've been the only person to sort of ace a test in the class and, and you were the only person who got 100 in a spelling bee in the fourth grade, sometimes some, that doesn't even feel positive for some, for, uh, not as always. So really, I, I appreciate you putting that in the room. Tony, um, tell us a little bit about you, about yourself, please. Uh, I am a, I'm Tony Duckett. I'm the Senior Vice President and Director of Sales for Vivro Water System. Don't get me in trouble if you say Vivro, people get angry. So it's Vivro Water System. And we help our clients uh, by helping them achieve their sustainability goals and health and wellness goals while saving money at the same time. And we do this by delivering them the best water possible in the marketplace. So that's what the company is all about. And to give you an example of a time that I felt like I was included, uh, it's, it's got to go back a while. I've been an executive for quite a few years in a lot of different companies. But your first foray into an executive uh, space, you're a little shaky. You're not sure where you're supposed to fit in and what you're supposed to say. Uh, and I was lucky enough that we found ourselves in a situation where there was a homogeneous set of folks and we were having trouble in an RSP and they couldn't figure out what the next move was. And someone literally turned to me and said, do you agree with this? Because I had been quiet for a while. And I just offered a twist to what possibly could, we could possibly be looking at. And it was really a twist on what I've seen in the meetings with the customers and what they may be asking for. And it offered a different perspective. And that different perspective then led to a conversation that got us to a, to, a, to kind of tweak our offering and ultimately win a deal. It wasn't my suggestion that won the deal, but it was the suggestion that created the conversation. I and mean, that was the first time that I think that folks started realizing that difference in the room makes a, it makes a difference. You know, having a whole bunch of people who think the same may feel good, but it won't get anything different. There's an old saying that says if you think the same way, you will get, if you do the same things, you get the same results. In order to get different results, sometimes you have to do something different. 
And fortunately for me, I had a, a group of people around me who reached out and said, do you, do you agree with what we're going? And I was open enough to share what I was thinking, and it worked. So it's been a long time coming, but uh, this conversation about diversity and inclusion, which is a different thing, I hope we get to that, diversity is a, is a decision, and inclusion kind of includes both the company and your courage to stand up and talk about it. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the future. Great. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate that. You know, you, you, I think your example that you made that somebody just leaned over and asked you what you thought, that means a lot. It's, it's those moments that matter, uh, that have such a rippling effect that we nece don't necessarily at the time realize just how possibly far reaching those, those, those comments are. When someone is an advocate or can amplify your voice to either uh, create an opportunity for your, your, your voice to not only be heard, but as, as we mentioned, ultimately value or at least create the, 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 the environment that allows other people to sort of weigh in on that. Thank you, Tony, appreciate that. Next, uh, Edward, let's uh, hear from Edward. Edward Lowe, our Vice President of Sales for Volante Systems. Edward. Hi everyone, I'm Edward, um, I'm VP of Sales at Volante. We're an enterprise uh, point of sale company based in Toronto, Canada, uh, with about 100 employees. Um, you know, the, the one time I felt included in the sense of belonging was, it's actually funny, it's similar to Z, where I was actually in New York where I met Danny and, you know, I, I normally don't like trade shows and conferences and Danny comes up to me and was like, we start talking and she was like, hey, you should apply for the Rise and Start program. Uh, so then I was like, maybe I'll do that. And then I, then I applied, I went home, I applied and then, um, then I got graciously accepted. Um, and then um, I got invited to this panel. Um, so I, I think uh, Danny, the culture at SHFM, everyone there has, you know, a really created environment where, you know, a sense of belonging and inclusion. So uh, thank you. I appreciate uh, everything everyone that everyone does. Great. Uh, thank you, Edward. Appreciate that. You know, the relationships are, are so, uh, this is an invaluable part of this whole process. And a lot of times I, I think, that uh, organizations can get caught up in not focusing on the, the relationship, but focusing on the task. And what we recognize over time is that what's the cost of not focusing on the relationship? The relationship allows us to complete the task a whole lot quicker. So thank you for putting that in the room. I would appreciate that. Uh, next up, uh, Brisbane Villancourt, uh, Vice President of Operations at Airmark and LifeWorks. Brisbane, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Absolutely. So um, I'm with LifeWorks and um, I've been with Aramark for almost five years. I've been in the LifeWorks group for about two years. Um, and so when we talk about a time that we feel included, so this is my third year as a rising star. And so I've been around uh, a lot of the same people for the last two years and really haven't shared my story with anybody. Um, in the workplace, I find myself reserved to share my story and be honest with everybody who, you know, the lifestyle that I live. Um, so most recently they were letting us know about this DNI panel and it gave me the courage to be honest with, with this, with the rising star group. And I raised my hand and said, I'll, I'll be on the panel. And, you know, I, at that moment in time, I let them know that I had a wife of six years and uh, two little girls. And it's the fact that, um, you know, we were having this panel and that they're making diversity such a focus that gave me that courage to be open and honest. It can be quite challenging at times to have, you know, two, two lives that you live, especially in the workplace where some people may know who you are and some people may not know who you are and then trying to remember who knows and who doesn't know. Um, so it, you know, it's hard to, to keep all that in your, in the back of your mind, um, you know, and continue to be successful in the workplace. So, once I came out to everyone on the call, they all reached out to me and it felt like a sense of relief and I felt so welcomed and I felt like it was easier for me to move forward and was looking forward to December where we would all come together because I felt like, you know, it, it would be a, a little bit more fun for me and I don't have to hide who I was, um, but we'll make up for that in Amelia Island uh, next year. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Brisbane, for sharing uh, a, little, uh, a little bit of vulnerability with the rest of us and um, being a little bit authentic and, and transparent. We appreciate that. You know, you raised the question of not uh, or the, the talking about what it's like to re try to remember who you told, who you didn't tell, uh, and just the amount of energy that requires. I think a lot of people may not necessarily recognize or realize that it requires an awful lot of energy to 
try to figure out what pronoun you're going to use to not necessarily out yourself in an environment that may not be as welcoming. Uh, and if I were to able to, if you were able or one were to able to focus and use all of that energy on creating that next innovation or coming up with the next new idea or some engineering solution or some sort of uh, advancement, uh, it, it's a whole lot better use of our time and our energy, right? Thank Absolutely. you for, for, for putting in it and sharing that with us. We appreciate that. So in, in keeping with the theme of, of change and embracing change and how to sort of navigate the, the concepts and constructs of change, Z, when you founded your, your, your um, culinary studio some what, five plus years ago, what did changes did you have to adapt or even adopt to uh, in order to create such a powerful um, recipe for success? I couldn't, I couldn't avoid the pun there. So okay. tell us a little bit about what you had to do in order to create that. What changes did you have to adapt and adopt? Well, there's a few things. Uh, when I first started Z the Cook, you know, I started from my house kitchen at home and I was just someone who loved to cook from the heart and I wanted to teach people how to cook from the heart and, um, you know, get, uh, and I found it to be a great positive social engagement. Um, I did, I, I do live in a um, very diverse city in Detroit, um, you know, from all different um, backgrounds. And I knew that there was, usually you'll find certain um, individuals or cultures sticking together and they don't necessarily uh, blend too much. So I knew that I wanted to be someone who helped to um, bring all different people together. So when I first started Z the Cook, that was definitely one of my recipes for success is to invite the public, invite people of all different backgrounds into my company um, so that they can get to know each other on a new level of socializing. Um, I also had to deal with you know just being a muslim woman business owner i think that i was underestimated a lot of times in this in this uh, journey um i think that a lot of people have pretty much thought that all i do is middle eastern food when really we offer all different kinds of cuisines asian and italian and mexican and middle eastern so i we do it all but we you know they see this and they just assume oh it's middle eastern food or it's just lebanese food for example so i have to step up my game by going on my marketing uh, sharing on social media uh, really pushing harder on now having that knowledge giving people the knowledge that just because I am a Muslim woman who owns a business, it doesn't make me any different than anyone else. And in addition to that as well, um, for, for example, um, I don't allow like my, my specific beliefs to interfere with my company, right? So I allow anyone to bring in, let's say their own drinks for their team building event with their companies, right? So I have been able to differentiate my background from my company. I want my company to be known as any other company in the world. It's just that it happens to be owned by a Muslim woman, right? So yeah, there's been some some things that I've had to do and not say or say just to make sure everyone understands that we are equal just like everyone else. It's a great example of having to adapt and adopt in order to sort of move through and, and, and flex, um, you know, to, to, to have that level of change and be able to sort of be comfortable being uncomfortable is yeah. sort of the hallmark of success around that. So appreciate you sharing that. Um, you know, it, as, a, as a part of my digging through as a, as a part of this moderator, I discovered that we have some former high level athletes on this panel who have succeeded at a fairly high level. Um, but with any sort of success on a team environment, you have to be masterful change agents. How do you tap into the ability to motivate and to spark change? And uh, how do you tap into that experience? as former athletes to sort of tap into that experience in order to spark change. I'll leave that to anybody who wants to field it. I wouldn't mind jumping in on that. I, I've had a, a, a doubt with that here or there. Um, I, I will say that the most important thing I've been able to do is, is actually keep my ears open and be willing to listen. Right? Uh, because everybody's motivated by something different. Uh, just for those who don't know much about me, I played basketball, I was a point guard. My job was to make everyone else better. In order to do that, you've got to know what drives them and to be able to tie that into what the team is trying to accomplish. Not much different than what we do in the business environment. Right? Each of us has a job to do, but it all rolls up to what we're trying to do in terms of driving revenue and, and, and profitability. I've used some of those tenets that I learned in sports and, and business, and they've been successful. 
because at the end of the day, everyone has a person as a business goal and then a personal goal, and your ability to tap into both of them, tie them together, and then tie them to the ultimate goal of what the company is trying to do is what will make you success. There has never been anybody who's been successful by themselves. Tiger Woods, great golfer, but he's got coaches and caddies and everyone else. Uh, tennis, tennis, the tennis players all have coaches and, and trainers. They have people who help them lift weights. There's never been anyone who's been The only time you're successful by yourself is if you buy a lottery ticket. And that's not anything you did. That's just luck. Uh, so the things that we have to work on require a team. And team requires you reaching out and understanding where people are coming from and then being able to meet them where they are and then meet you where you are as well. So it's, it's an interesting connection between sports and business, and I found it to be fascinating and something that kind of drives me through my life. Great. Thank you, Tony, for sharing that. Uh, anyone else on the panel want to share um, how they managed to sort of transition success in sports or anything else into uh, their current day-to-day? -day? Brisbane? <laughs> yeah, you know, it was a, a conversation I actually had with my parents a couple of weeks ago um, and really talked about how playing softball and, and being a leader on a team has really helped, you know, pat, give me a good path for my future and, and has made me a better leader today. Um, you know, those are experiences that you know, we, I think we miss, you know, going back into high school and college and just really good experiences. You work with a, um, or you're playing with a very diverse team and, you know, people of all different talents. And so even, you know, when you're in high school, making sure that you included the freshmen, um, whether they were good or they weren't good, it was always just a standard on the team that it was an inclusive environment. You had fun together. It didn't matter where they lived, how much money they had, what their race was, um, they, it, it did not matter. We were a successful team and we won together and we lost together. And if you take that into your work life, you know, it, it really helps, you know, build a successful path for you. Right. Can I add one thing to Brisbane's point? I, I think that leadership thing you said is critical. I mean, leaders are people people want to follow. And the only reason they would want to follow you is that you've shown that you care about them. Right? And that old adage, people can't want to know how much you care, then they care how much you know. That really matters. So when, when they know that you care about them, then they follow you through the fire, knowing on the other side that there's going to be a reward for everyone. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you made that leadership point. Now, yeah, a, when I, in high school, my coach always used to say, because I was the pitcher, and so you always got the credit, and he'd always teach me, don't take the credit when you get interviewed by the paper. Make sure you give credit to someone else on your team, because it'll make mm -hmm. people want to follow you more. Mm -hmm. So it's always a principle I've um, focused on as I've continued to grow in my career because it's not just you whether you're at the you know helm of the ship or not it takes an entire team and you need to make sure you give credit and recognize those that work for you because that's how you're going to get you know continue to be successful as those that are that work for you. Yeah a lot of times they, they want to focus on the pitcher because they throw so many no hitters or perfect games those kinds of things but you're right it is your uh, a product of the success of, of, of everyone that supports that. Absolutely. Thank you for both sharing that. Any else on the, anyone else on the panel have an example uh, that they can draw on? And it, again, it doesn't necessarily have to be sports or it could be uh, where past experiences that have taught you how to sort of adapt and adopt and uh, build in. Edward? Well, uh, I'm not sports related, but I, I wanted to uh, talk about that, uh, you know, winning as a team and especially in sales, although you may get the credit and you, you close the deals and people might think you're, you're the hero and you're winning for the company, but you know, in sales, you, you're, you're nobody without the rest of your team. You, you can't sell anything if you don't have a good support team, you have good implementation, good uh, marketing, um, you know, product engineering. So it's really important that if you win, uh, win humbly. Uh, and if you win, you know, share the credit to everyone else because without them, uh, you wouldn't be where you are today. And sometimes I think as sales people and sales leaders, you might lose sight of that because you always get the win and you, you might think that it's all your credit, but it's not. Share it, be humble, and win together. Great. Thank you. Pre appreciate that, Edward. You know, just uh, sort of, uh, shifting gears a little bit, and again, but still staring within the theme of um, uh, it, it embracing change, you know, it, it's impossible to ignore. We've heard it already a couple of times about our, we're in the midst of COVID um, and we keep talking about um, what it's going to be like to get back to normal, whatever that is, or what it's going to be like to get back to the new normal. 
what can we begin to do now in order to prepare for the inev inevitable changes that lie ahead? I'll leave that open to anyone who would like to take that. What can we do now to begin to prepare for the inevitable change that lies ahead? I'd like to um, go ahead and answer that. Um, yeah. I definitely like to lead by example. So definitely be the change you want to see in the world. So just stepping up your game, you know, like I mentioned Danny doing with me, it's, you know, sometimes you do have to get a little uncomfortable to get comfortable, right? So if you see someone who you may not typically, you know, approach or to speak to, get, you know, go, go a little bit, do something different than you, what you've typically done, you know, just go introduce yourself, go talk to other people, um, get to know other people's backgrounds, because you never know what you might find, you might find your next best friend, you know, um, and so being a, an example and being that person who steps up, I think other people will see you as that leader, and they'll want to mimic that as well, especially for the children, right, for the youth. I mean, they're watching us, we're parents, we're aunts, we're uncles, right? They're watching every move we make. They're the future and they're the future generation and they're gonna be the real change, right? So we have to be walking, talking examples. I've had kids come even to see the cook and I've heard certain comments that I really didn't approve of or didn't like, but it's all about helping them understand. Being, not allowing it to just leave your building and be like, oh, that's just how they are. No, actually, going up to that person and saying, you know, I understand where you're coming from. You may not have the knowledge that let's say I have, let me inform you about the differences between people. Let me tell you why it's so special that people are different. Everyone brings a different flavor to the group. Everyone brings a different perspective. And it's so nice to hear other people's perspectives. You might not agree with them, but it's good insight. It's good to know. So definitely be an example of what you want. So serving food and food for thought, right? <laughs> I appreciate that. It's not just Z the cook. It's like Z the cook, not just for food. We're cooking up leaders. We're cooking up success. We're cooking up passion. You know, so it's the marketing just writes itself, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely, that's perfect. You know what I think um, COVID has taught myself is that uh, in a COVID world, we're, we're, we're quite we're, we're a lot more similar than we might think. COVID doesn't care if you're rich, poor, what your background is, where you're from, it's gonna affect us all. We're all humans. And I think what we can do today as leaders in your organization um, is you know, hire a group of people or hire people who is representative of your country or your diversity or a global uh, workforce, because you know, it doesn't matter what your background is. We're, we're all the same, we're all humans. Right. I think it's going to be really important that before we jump off, I think it's going to be really important that we stay open because we don't know what the new future is going to look like, right? And we can only see, we're all products of our experiences. So you tend to see something that was built from your experience. So your vision into the future will be shaped in some form or fashion based on what you've already experienced. And we've all had different experiences. So being open to all of those things will give us an opportunity to at least be able to get a glimpse of what it might look like because none of us know what it's going to look like on the other side. We don't know how long this is going to take and what it's going to require of us to change when we get down the road. But someone, even the, and I, I learned early in my life that every the kids sometimes out of the voice of out of the mouth of babes you get some incredible information. So being able to listen to folks who you don't think, maybe you didn't listen to before, you may find that one jewel that will help you downstream. Uh, that's a great point, and it just sort of happens to fit right in with the question that we just received. You know, we talk a lot about you know, generations and I think subconsciously a lot of people think about millennials and we hear that word thrown around quite a bit. But with five generations and people retiring later, we end up with a some, oftentimes an older population. What can we do to leverage the wealth of experience and perspectives of that ton, those, that wealth of experience that comes from from tenure how do we leverage those perspectives in a way that uh, allows us to be a little bit more inclusive as well I'll start with that if you know my I think Please. it's a couple of things it's two-sided those who have tenure I have some tenure I have to get my my mind open so that I let those folks if I wanted to be able to influence them I have to give them a voice as well Right? So they've got to be they've got to be heard. So it's got to be a bi-directional, it's got to be a conversation. It can't be me just speaking to them about what I've already experienced. I'll use a, a, a bad example is my son is incredible with with technology. I'm not. Right? Uh, I read an article called Digital Natives versus Digital Immigrants. I'm an immigrant. 
I, all of this stuff is stuff that came in my lifetime. He can do his homework, listen to music, and play a video game at the same time. That could never, I could have never done that. But those kinds of things are the things that these newer, the newer generations are capable of doing. And we have to be open to those, those ways. So the best way to get them to, to, to buy into the wisdom of, of experience is to be open to the wisdom of technology and new things as well. Those who are listened to tend to listen. Great, thank you, Tony. Hey, uh, who else on the panel would like to sort of take a stab at how do we uh, sort of embrace embrace the sixty plus age category? I have yes. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, you know, uh, I'm a millennial, uh, and when we were about six, seven years ago, our software company was a lot different than we are today, and I think our average age was at that time was like. 27 and you know we did a lot of things really well like you know putting up fires and you know being up at 3 a.m and getting things done and evenings and weekends but we were really bad at a lot of other things like you know following up with a customer or you know ensuring that processes are followed so as we were scaling the company we start hiring more diverse uh you know different generations um baby boomers uh, 60 plus and that entirely changed our entire company. We, we became a more mature, you know, well thought out organization with better processes. Our customer service was through the roof. Our response time was uh, amazing. And, and I think that's important to bring in different, um, you know, generations and groups and leverage what, you know, the tenure and experience that they can bring to the table. That's a great example, uh, Edward. Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, Z, you were about to ch chime in on that as well. Yeah, you know, when I when I see the question, you know, 60 plus and the older generation, it reminds me of an actual uh, culinary team building event that I did here at Z the Cook. So there was a company um, in the United States, it's a very well known company, and um, a lot of the employees, the upper executives were coming together in Detroit for their um, conferences um, at the Renaissance Center. And during their one week of conferences, they wanted to do something fun together to do a little bit of team building. So they did hire me to host an event for them. And so I was really excited about it. And I thought most likely all of the attendees would at least maybe look into Z the Cook online or maybe just Google it just to kind of see um, what we're all about. But I guess a lot of them didn't. So what happened was it was in the winter time and we're talking like an older generation, mostly men. Um, they all walked in to the studio. It was evening around 6 p.m. and it was cold. So they all had coats on. And I, I was, as soon as they walked in, my staff and I were standing there just to host them and we're waiting. And as soon as they walked in, I said, can I collect everyone's coats? You know, come on, you know, you guys get comfortable. Let me give everyone some aprons. And um, a lot of them, were taking their jackets off and they were like handing them over to my staff while a lot of them were also not taking their jackets off and they were looking at me in a way like what in the heck are we doing here you know and i noticed that they were a little bit stunned and um, maybe um taken aback just with the unexpected you know they were un unexpected you know maybe just the way that me i looked they were not expecting it you know and i was very bubbly as i always am and really excited and everyone come on take your jackets off so they weren't taking their jackets off and I, I felt the tension and I was like, oh boy, I have some work to do tonight. I have more work than I expected tonight because now not only do I have to host this amazing team building event for them, but I also have to try to break down a little bit of stereotyping because I felt it. You know, you can- Full time feel, job, isn't it? Yeah, you can sense it. And so I was like, it's okay. If you don't want to take your jacket off, that's totally fine. Let's go in the kitchen and let's just like get started. So I, I stood at my station and everyone was standing there and I just started being Z, you know, I just started to be myself and really welcoming and caring and hospitable, right? So bring it back to the food and hospitality industry, very hospitable. And I knew not to allow that energy to, to be transformed into mine. I wanted to make sure that my energy would change the way that they were feeling. So I had to be very like powerful, step up my game a little bit more, be very, very nice. You know how they say like kill them with kindness. So right. I definitely had to use that, that, that technique. Long story short, we went through the 10 minutes later, I would say 10 to 15 minutes later, they slowly but surely started to remove the jackets and put the aprons on 
just because I think that my approach was really caring and loving and everything. Um, so once they started to take their jackets off, put their aprons on, by the time we were done cooking and eating together, I mean, the same people who were really hesitant about taking their jackets off were like trying to pick me up off the ground. They were really loving. They were like talking wow. to me. Just a transformation in their energy and their vibe. So what I would say is to anyone 60 years old and older, yes, you might have been taught something a certain way or you may, the media may have showed you things in the past, right? But I highly suggest and I highly hope that anyone in that generation will take it upon themselves to, again, get uncomfortable and to, you know, um, anyone with like any kind of preference or religion or background, don't take what you've learned in the media as the only education you're going to receive, right? You right. want to be first right. and you want firsthand experience. Just say hello to that person and just get to know them first before that real judgment comes into play. Cause I know, you know, we were talking about it before, right? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. You know, you raise a great point. I think uh, Z, thank you for sharing that about the, the power of the relationship uh, in, in, again, sort of related to COVID, that the proximity and the, the proximity as, as, as lend itself naturally to sort of cultivating in a relationship. In a virtual world, we recognize in a service-based industry just how strong relationships are. Yeah. Brisbane, can you share with us, Brisbane, some perspective on how you are creating and sustaining relationships in a virtual um, atmosphere? Yeah. Um, fortunately, the last, you know, couple of weeks, we've gotten back into business and I've been able to see a lot of my team in person, um, which feels really good. I think there is a void as many, as much as people say they love the whole work from home, there's still a need to collaborate. We inspire each other and it's a different experience when, when you're able to rub shoulders a bit um, with, with people on your team and, and with your clients and, and with, you know, other peers within your own organization. Um, but, you know, it, it's about creating a team in an inclusive environment and really getting to know your people. Um, a, a lot of times in our world, you know, you don't just work for your employer, but you also work for whoever your client is. So, um, you know, I work for LifeWorks and Aramark, but I also oversee a good portion of the J.P. Morgan Chase business um, for the contracted food service in the U.S. So at... at at, at times, sometimes I feel like I work for them and I'm part of their culture. And at times I feel like I work part, you know, for Aramark and LifeWorks and part of that culture. So I think it's really important, um, you know, in our hospitality world where we may have some of our employees working for multiple clients or one client, really, you know, continuing to help understand what that culture is and, and how they fit into that culture and, and give them perspective, you know, in, in changing the mindset at some other companies. We've made great progress in the DNI world, um, in our industry and hospitality. I think there's a lot of work that needs to continue to be done, you know, in some other industries, but, you know, for us to continue to lead the way, um, and, and find ways to change the perspective of the world, um, and make sure people are focused on, you know, diversity and inclusion, because it, it does make a team stronger, similar to what Ed said a little while ago, you know, the more of a diverse team you have, the more successful we likely will be. Absolutely. Thank you, Brisbane, for that. Tony, did you have something to add to that as well? Uh, I would just echo her thoughts. I mean, what personally, what I do is I reach out to my team as often as I can, probably talking to each of them two or three times a week and, and leading off with what's going on with you and your life. I want to know how, how are you coping with being home? I look, we all love our families, but we need a break from time to time, so we need to get out. So how, how are you managing that? How are you managing not having any other input from other folks? And it, but it doesn't stop with me. The other managers on our team do the same thing. And today, the company is taking a, the approach. Uh, Vivro is having a virtual barbecue. Uh, so from top down, from Drew Hamilton, our, our CEO, down, we're taking the approach, let's keep touching each other so we know we care. Right? Let's keep touching each other and know that we're going through the same challenges and we're working through this together because at the end of the day, uh, several of the panelists have always said, we're one team, one company. So if, if we either move together, we win together, or we lose together, let's keep going. So the company is taking that approach. I do some stuff myself, but it's everybody doing this together. Absolutely right. Virtual barbecue. How can I get an invitation? <laughs> you can get an invitation. We just can't send you food. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's kind of cruel. I think in the beginning, Eric, everyone was focused on video calls, and then they started to get a little tired. So continuing to 
break up the monotony, you know, right. whether it's a, you know, a team text message where we're sending pictures of what we made for dinner that night or sending a handwritten thank you to someone on your team, little things like that is a little different um, and continues to make people feel special and, and, you know, helps energize us to keep moving forward. You know, we don't know how long it's going to be like this, but everything we can do to keep us focused and positive will make it, you know, we'll, we'll get through it a lot faster. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you all for those uh, insightful answers. Uh, we'll turn it over. I think we're at the time right now, are we not for opening up for Q and A? So um, in monitoring the chat box, I'm not seeing any questions. We have 72 participants. I'm sure there's some burning questions or comments that you'd like to make and, and uh, toss out for us to, to sort of socialize. If there's something, please go ahead and uh, utilize the chat feature to uh, ask your questions. And in the meantime, uh, we'll uh, just sort of pepper. I know that we talk about diversity and inclusion. What is, Edward, what does inclusion mean for, for you? Uh, not only from a personal standpoint, but also from a professional standpoint. What does inclusion look and feel like for you? Well, um, uh, I am uh, Asian uh, of descent and uh, I am from Canada. So, you know, I think I've been pretty fortunate enough that I grew up in a culture and a country where, you know, inclusion and diversity is in our core. You know, and not being inclusive and, and diverse uh, we kind of, we, we don't like that. We, we shun against that kind of thinking and mentality. So I, I think that's, um, you know, very important to us. Uh, what that has led me to do in my professional uh, environment is, um, you know, uh, I strive to have one of the most diverse team members in my, uh, on my team. So I lead our sales and marketing team. I have almost 50-50 um, women to uh, male ratio. I have like every single ethnic backgrounds you can think of. Um, and, and you know what is really important about that is you have way better dinner parties. Your team dinner parties are way more fun if you have, you know, uh, old, young, um, you know, with a mixed background. So I, I think it's very important to, uh, you know, just include it. You'll, you'll get way more strength and skill sets and it'll help complement some of uh, your weaknesses. Great. No, that's a, that's a great... Great uh, suggestion there, and it's, it must be lunchtime because we've heard two answers that referenced food. Um, <laughs> so um, that's that's good to hear. You know, a, a question just popped on the the chat box, and I think it's very timely as well. That in these times where there is massive amount of change that's happening, we run into people who may not necessarily believe in certain things. Uh, you know, it runs counter to their their personal ideology. How do you or have you in the past? help those that may not necessarily believe, but have an expectation of, okay, I understand that you don't necessarily believe that, but here's an expected behavior that we have. How do you, how do you manage to get people to the, out of the belief uh, bucket into the behavior bucket? I'm gonna answer first, I guess. Um, yeah, thank you so much. So there's a difference between your beliefs and being a respectful person, right? So we can't force people to believe a certain thing. Everyone, every individual is born on their own. They have rights and they have the rights to their beliefs. All we can do is be the best that we can be and um, also advertise ourselves and, you know, show the world the best part that person that we can be. And if, if and we would hope that they would just be respectful of that. So that's why I come back around and say, um, it's okay to not share the same beliefs as other people, but at least be respectful and be a good human, right? So there's humanity. So I always take it back to humanity, being a good person. Absolutely. Good. Great answer. Uh, any other uh, additions to that? I think from a corporate perspective, I mean, there, if, if you're clear about what the expectation, the culture, and the, and, and the, desire, the, the needs of a position are, and, and you and you stay there. You take the emotion out of it, and you stay you stay focused on what the company's trying to accomplish. I don't really care what you believe in. This is what we're trying to do, and as a company, we're trying to do these things. If you do your job, we don't have to agree. Matter of fact, I like to listen to people who have uh, different opinions than I do. That's how I don't know. I disagree with you unless I hear you. So I've got to be able to listen to that as well. But there's a, there's also some decorum that has to happen. There are ways to disagree with people. There are places to disagree with people. 
And as long as, to Zeus's point, as long as everyone remains respectful, you're allowed to have different opinions. But yeah. at, at, there are also things that were called conditions of employment. Right? So you've got to have certain behavior that keep you employed. Right? You, you, you have options still, right? Yeah, you do. <laughs> right. Thank you both for weighing in on that. Another question just popped in, I think is also extraordinarily timely. You know, a lot of times we, when we talk about diversity, it, it's, it, we think about the tip of the iceberg, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and the like. But if we go below the surface and look at the broader definitions of diversity, uh, what, from your organizational standpoint, um, have you done to sort of embrace uh, people with disabilities? Uh, any, any insight there? I actually have four disabled uh, interns who come uh, from a company called STEP. So I do partner with a co company that is a nonprofit organization that allows uh, young professionals or even professionals who have disabilities to work in um, a workspace with an, a mentor or an advisor who kind of stays with them. And they're actually able to gain experience in our company. They're able to learn from my staff and I. Um, they also learn like their own techniques. For example, they're chopping veggies, they're prepping food, they're helping us with our catering jobs. It's amazing. So I love to do that for them. I've even posted a prom night for some of them before, um, mm -hmm. just on my own. And I just like love to encourage that. And then we also have our, you know, um, facility created in a way that will help anyone who is disabled or handicapped, for example. That has uh, disabled access. All right, uh, Brisbane, did you have anything to weigh in on that one? No, I think Z said it really, really well there. Okay. I think, um, you know, there are so many ways we can include people and the fact that, you know, she's built her facility to, inc you know, include them and, and make it really easy for people mm -hmm. to be successful with Z the Cook. I think that's a really good story and hard to tap. Great, thanks. So uh, another question popped in uh, on the board and we talk about, you know, what, what are some of the dynamics of diversity and inclusion that we can anticipate facing down the road? I mean, you know, I think right now we're hearing uh, a lot about race and race relations and, but you know, and it's because of some certain social events, but what do we anticipate the next wave to be? How can we begin to think about getting in front of, of issues and being more product, uh, proactive uh, than, and then having to be less reactive. Any ideas in terms of what you think might be the, the, the next elephant in the room that we need to tackle? I think that people being alone for too long is not a good thing because when you're alone and you're only with the news or the media, you know, you tend to be so closed off from the reality of the world and being there in person and meeting new people. So it's a little bit fearful to me that the more people stay isolated or even in their workplace, keeping to themselves is not a good thing. You have to talk to your peers. You have to talk to your coworkers. You have to be a little more social so you can open up to others and others can open up to you as well. So I think that the enemy is- That's a, that's a good, that's a definitely a good response. And I think Tony alluded to that a little bit as well about checking on people. Um, uh, mental health is, is, is certainly something we should consider. You know, it's one of those things that has come out of the closet as well, that people are beginning to talk about the necessity of taking care of one's mental health as well as one's physical health. So uh, I would certainly agree with that. I would, add, I would add one thing. I think that's an amazing thing. Trust is critical on both parties. And one of the things that we have to make sure we teach the rising stars, whoever they may be in our organization, is that part of being inclusive is being is having courage too, right? So I, I could reach out to you, but if you're not willing to share, if you're not being thoughtful, that so you I mean have, it's better to ha have an opportunity and not be prepared than it is to have an opportunity to not to not be prepared at all, right? So make sure you're being thoughtful and then reach out for, to them on smaller things and ease them into to an environment where they can be trusting of you and you're trusting of them, but they will have the the managerial courage to speak up. I, if, if I use me as an example, my first foray into management, I wasn't as courageous as I might be now. I was worried about, if, what am, suppose I say the wrong thing, what are they going to think about me? And that's what happens when you are one of few in a room, you get nervous. Uh, mm -hmm. But you've got to trust in yourself, trust in your, your peers, and they've got to create an environment where you being open is okay. You know, absolutely right. C cultivating an environment where you can build trust 
uh, the worst time to build trust is when you need it, right? Yeah. So uh, how can you begin to sort of cultivate that in advance and be proactive in that, resp in that respect? Um, we're, uh, another quick question from the, from the, uh, for the panel. I'll put this out here for Edward. Um, how do preconceived biases waste relationships? Or how do they, pre how do preconceived biases conspire against uh, friendships and relationships? Can you give me an example of that? <laughs> Anyone else want to try and tackle that one? I, I guess I can tackle it if you like. I mean, you start off in a hole, right? So now you've got to climb out of the hole to create a connection, as opposed to, I mean, we, bias is real. We all have biases. We all have, you can't walk into a relationship with anybody and not have some preconceived notion when you see them. We're all visual beings. That's what happens. But if you dig that hole too deep and you've got to climb out of it, it's a lot to recover from to find out this is a great person, right? People are good and people are bad of all, all sorts of colors and creeds. If you treat everyone individually and let them get, give them the opportunity to show you where they stand and where they live, they will, they will typically show you in a very short period of time. And to quote Maya Angelou, if they show you who you are, you should believe them. All right? so, and then you know how to treat them. Absolutely. Great. Thank you for that. Now, one other question. I think we have one time for one more question. Growing up in Toronto and now living in a smaller city in the Midwest, the amount of diversity is a challenge. How do you create exposure for teams and staff uh, to DNI when in areas that don't necessarily appear to be diverse? I, I think it comes back to the culture of the organization that you work for. And so, um, you know, for with it, Aramark, we have multiple ERG groups and, and we make it a priority uh, to make everyone feel inclusive. And it's, you know, something that I really embraced when I joined on when I first started looking for, for jobs. Um, I was with the last company for 13 years and uh, someone said to me, you know, don't be who you are. You don't know if that they'll accept it. And so I worked for a privately owned restaurant group for 13 years and I was like, hmm, is that really the corporate world? Okay, well, I'll, you know, put, I'll put that wall up. And, um, you know, I was quite amazed with how important um, diversity and making sure everyone felt included and safe and, and how important culture was at Aramark. Um, and I think if we continue to make culture and, and everyone feeling included and make sure that everyone's story is open, um, you know, it'll be a much better environment for people to work in. And you'll see longevity. You'll see people stay with companies for a long time. When you feel like you're part of something and part of that organization and part of their overall success, you know, it, it doesn't give you a reason to want to look for a, a job elsewhere. You want to continue to be proud of the organization you work for. Absolutely. Well said, Brisbane. People do, people do not leave where they're loved, right? Exactly. Absolutely. Well, listen, we are already at the conclusion of the, of, uh, of the panel discussion. It went by very quickly, but I want to, on behalf of myself and the rest of the panel mates, express our gratitude for you for sharing your time and your energy with us this afternoon. Uh, or this morning in some cases, and, and d diving into this conversation. And then we look forward to it, just to remind you that the conversation doesn't end here, it continues, and to look for opportunities to, to continue that conversation and to uh, look for ways to cultivate an inclusive environment. With that, I'll turn it back over to Rob. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eric, and, uh, and Tony Z, Edward, and Brisbane for uh, another impactful session. Um, I guess the only words I'm left with is wow. I mean, I'm just, I'm always impressed by the conversations that we have. Um, you know, your, your willingness to be open, to be vulnerable, to kind of share honest feelings about topics that are very personal. Um, that's exactly what we need to do, right? And we're, we're dealing with challenging conversations and challenging times. So thank you all for, uh, for participating today. Uh, just a couple of closing notes, if I can. Uh, following today's event, you will receive a conference evaluation via email, so please do take a moment to complete that very important survey. Um, and then uh, just two final things about exciting upcoming SHF, SHFM events that I want to share. 
Um, the first one, join us in person, and I will highlight that in person. Yes, we're getting together uh, for the SHFM Foundation Golf Tournament on Monday, October 19th with a 10.30 a.m. shotgun start at the Metuchen Golf and Country Club in Edison, New Jersey. If you are not a golfer but still want to join the in-person fun, you can join us for the reception at 3 p.m. that same day. Uh, SHFM will require following all state COVID-19 guidelines as well as those that have been established by the club. And finally, to close out, as your chair for the SHFM 2020 Virtual National Conference, I am excited and, and personally very thankful for the work that the committee has done to put forward a great uh, conference uh, a session coming up December 1st through the 9th. Registration details will be coming out in early October, so be sure to check your email for all of the details and for the exciting things that we have planned. Once again, thank you for joining us today and look forward to seeing everybody very soon.